<laughs> Today, the city of Kabul is just a shell of what it was once. This is the city of my childhood memories, where I was born and lived my youth. When the civil war began in 1992, war became the constant reality there. The warlords bombed our city and thousands of innocent people were killed. My tribe called Hazara tribe has experienced the, mo the worst violence in the history of Afghanistan. The Hazara was one of the largest tribe in the country before 63% of us being killed by King Abdurrahman. Women and children were sold into slavery just for one cent. There was a bridge in Kabul above the Kabul River called One Cent Bridge. The name is taken from the prize that was put on the Hazaras. When I was a child, Kabul was a beautiful city. There was no hatred among the civilized people, just love. I lived in the best part of the city with lovely neighbors from, from different tribes. My dad owned and ran a grocery store located about 10 miles away from our house. And my mom was a housewife. I was enrolled in Afshar Elementary School only a mile away from our house. I was in Miss Leila's class. She was a woman of noble form and graceful proportions. She looked like the Indian movie stars that my family watched on TV on Friday nights at home. One day I was sitting in her class taking notes while Miss Leila lectured. Suddenly a terrible explosion happened. Everybody in my class lay down on the ground and hided themselves under the tables. When I first opened my eyes after the explosion, all I could see was dust, broken window glasses, and hearing, screaming, and crying. When I stood up after the explosion, I saw my beautiful teacher falling on the ground and bleeding. She was wounded. When the sun was shining, the cold and sad breeze was blowing and the black and dark smoke was camouflaging the school's sky. I was running toward the main office to inform that Miss Leila got wounded. The second explosion took place outside the school. I didn't stop and proceeded my way to the main office building and informed them. Soon after all injured bodies taken to the hospital, the school principal lined up all the students and told us that the schools will be closed due to insecurity. The security got worse and the school closed forever. One day my parents were sitting at home and talked about the civil war. As they were talking, suddenly our door burst open. I saw the dreadful faces of warlords with long hair and beards, walking into our house and pointing their AK-47 and machine guns on my dad, they asked him, Askodam Basti, what group are you belonging to? My dad laughed and replied, I'm only Afghan citizen. I'm not belonging to any warlord group. I saw the bloody hand of the warlord who pulled his trigger and shot on my dad's leg. He shouted that, that my father must choose a group to belonging to, and then they left our house. My dad was screaming, rolling over the ground, and asking for help while bleeding. My brave mom took a bandage and tied up the wounds and ran out to get a taxi to take my dad to the hospital. The blood covered the entire floor the clock was clicking slowly, and the shooting sound is still hovered in the room. I wished I could stand up against the warlords to protect my dad. I had never seen people like the warlords with their brutal faces before. I had known the kinder, more civilized people of my city. We were afraid. 
I sat with my little brother reading the scriptures of Holy Quran and asking, for, and asking the Almighty God to bring my parents back home safe. Three hours later, my mom came home and told that my dad would have seen the hospital for a while. While my mom was packing our staff to move to a civil location, the war was getting hotter. All I could hear were rocket shootings and explosions. We left our house to stay with my mom's sisters in a safer part of the city and then moved into an empty apartment in the same area with no beds, no blankets, not even a carpet on the floor. It was the first really cold night of my life that I spent and I lay awake. In the morning, my mom went to the market to get us breakfast but she came back with only two braids on her hand. That was all she could afford. That morning our breakfast was a piece of bread and a glass of boiled water. Later, on the way to my mom's sister's house, I saw a little boy selling cigarettes and snacks. I got the idea that I could do the same job like him to feed my family. To be honest, I didn't know how to feed my family. But I had to be brave to stand by my mom and to motivate her to not give up. For two years, I sold cigarettes to soldiers on the front line. Each day saying goodbye to my mom and my brother, I thought, maybe this is the last moment that I see my mom and my brother. Maybe I will never come back home. When the fighting would heat up, the rockets and gunshots, I would hide myself behind the walls and destroy houses to keep myself safe. I was scared, but I was also making enough profit to feed my family and support my dad. And that was all that mattered to me. When my dad finally recovered and was able to work again, he decided to leave Afghanistan and flee to Pakistan. We all went to Pakistan. I hoped we were headed to an easier life there. Life was challenging in Pakistan as well. We worked very hard there. But that was also where my destiny began to change for the better. It was there that my brother and I enrolled in, in, in English class. And after two years of hard work, I was able to get my English language completion certificate. It was my biggest achievement in my entire life. Soon after I got my certificate, I wanted to try to work as a translator. My family supported this idea, so I made my plan and came back to Afghanistan by myself to work as a translator with the US military forces. At first, I didn't have a way in. One day, I saw a group of young men walking toward a destroyed military base. I thought maybe there was an interview. I didn't ask anybody. and just followed, followed them silently. When I got there, it turned out they were hiring translators. I was so excited to be there, but also scared. What if I didn't pass? I didn't know anything, anything about the military terminologies. At the gate, I collected words from other people, like, hey, what do you call for rifle? What do you call for magazine? I was practicing with myself so I could say the words that I knew. Three hours later, I walked into a room with no windows, no doors. Only three chairs, three Americans and one Afghan sitting there. They were from the US Embassy and one whose name I still remember is Major Tim. Major Tim was the nicest person I had ever met. How old are you? He asked doubtfully. I looked young. 18. I said, I'm 18. You look a little young for 18. He repeated with a smile in his eyes. Really, I was 16. I think he knew, but he smiled and let it slide. He didn't ask me too much questions. He was impressed with my knowledge of the language 
and mostly excited that I was Hazara. He spoke so highly of the Hazara people and knew that Hazara are the most peaceful and organized people in the country and were friends of the Americans. Of all the men there to interview, I was the only Hazara. It meant a lot to meet a kind person from other side of the world who was thinking about the Hazaras, who could have known that after so much persecution and great and greatest blessing of my life would come from being a Hazara. My dream came true. I was hired as a translator for U.S. Special Forces. I worked with high-ranking military officers for 14 years at the tactical, operational, strategic, and national levels. This allowed us to bring my, my parents back to Afghanistan, and life began to become sweet for us again. We began to find peace between the chaos. Years later in 2015, when I arrived in America, the first person I called was the colonel I worked with him in Afghanistan. He lives in Albuquerque. And when I called his number, his wife answered. I told her it was Amin and that I used to be a translator for her husband, Andy Anderson. I couldn't believe over the phone how excited she was. She said, I'm so happy you made it to the US. We were always praying for you and your safety. It was like she was my mom. I'm just so happy I was out of the conflict now. It has been the greatest honor of my life to work with the US military as a translator. And I'm thankful every day for what they have done for the Afghan citizens especially for the most deprived people of Hazaras, my family, and for me. God bless America.